I want to welcome you all to the session on independent journalism on war, conflict, and human rights. I'll introduce our extraordinary panel shortly. I'm Jeff Cohen, the founder of the Media Watch Group FAIR, and now the director of the Park Center for Independent Media at Ithaca College. Uh, each spring at Ithaca, we give out an annual award for outstanding achievement in independent media named after IF Izzy Stone. It's called the Izzy Award. In 12 days, we will bestow the Izzy Award on the fifth annual winner. That's the nonprofit news outlet, Mother Jones, which broke story after story last year, including the now infamous Mitt Romney, 47% of American voters are moochers <laughs> undercover video. Some of you know I spent years as a political pundit on mainstream television, on CNN, Fox, MSNBC. I was outnumbered, outshouted, red baited, finally terminated. But now I'm free, and since none of us here are constrained within the mainstream media, we can freely discuss the elephant in the room, the issue that largely explains why other countries can have free college education, universal health care, but we're told that our country can't afford it. It's the problem that may be bigger than all other problems in our country because it so exacerbates all those other problems. It's a problem that Martin Luther King focused on before he was assassinated 45 years ago this week, and it's only gotten worse since, and that was the height of the Vietnam War. I'm talking, of course, about the problem of militarism and perpetual war. King called the United States quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. And he said, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. So we're gathered here today to discuss the unmentionable, the elephant in the room. You know, MSNBC hosts can yell at Fox News hosts and vice versa about all sorts of issues but when the Obama administration expanded the hopeless, bloody war in Afghanistan, the shouting heads on both channels went virtually silent. As Obama's drone war expanded, there was little shouting on either of those channels, or CNN, or CBS, or ABC, or so-called public broadcasting, NPR and PBS. We can have raging debates in the mainstream media on all sorts of issues, like gun control, minimum wage, gay marriage, but when the elites of both major parties agree on a military intervention, as they so often do, then anyone in the mainstream media who goes out on the limb to question or even acknowledge that in the middle of the room there is this oversized creature known as militarism or interventionism, well, they're likely to disappear faster than you can say Phil Donahue. I worked with Phil Donahue. I know a little bit about journalists getting silenced for questioning bipartisan military adventures because I was with Phil at MSNBC in 2002 and 3 when Bush was revving up the invasion of Iraq with the support of Democratic leaders Joe Biden, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, Harry Reid, and MSNBC terminated us for the crime of JWI. That, that's not DWI, uh, JWI, that's journalism during wartime while independent. JWI may be a crime in mainstream media, but it's exactly the kind of unauthorized, unembedded coverage that you get from the authors and the journalists that we've assembled on this panel. It's the kind of coverage you get from the Jeremy Scahills and the Darja Males and the Glenn Greenwalds, and it's the kind of coverage you get from the independent media outlets that are so featured uh, at this conference this weekend. Many liberal journalists who were vocal about war and human rights and civil liberties during the Bush era, well, they seem to have lost or muted their voices during the Obama era. It says something about the lack of serious national debate about so-called national security that last month one of the loudest mainstream TV news questioners of the president's right to assassinate Americans was Sean Hannity at Fox, and that's obscene. It says something about mainstream TV 
that the toughest and most consistent questioners of militarism and defenders of civil liberties are not on a news channel. They're on the comedy channel. A few weeks ago, I watched a very passionate John Stewart taking on US military spending. He said, quote, we already spend more on defense than the next 12 countries combined, including China, including Russia. We're like the lady on Jerry Springer who can't stop getting breast implants. And of course, he put up the photo of the Jerry Springer guest. What our mainstream media so obediently calls the war on terror is experienced in other countries as a US war of terror. Kidnappings, night raids, torture, drone strikes, the killing and maiming of innocent civilians that just creates more enemies for our country. You know, you can get that reality, ironically, in some of the mainstream media of our allied countries in Europe, but you can't get it in the mainstream media in our country, and it is our country that is waging this global perpetual war, which in a democracy should be the subject of a raging debate. We've assembled this panel because all of our panelists have rigorously subjected US war policies to questioning and debate, no matter who is in the White House. They've worked hard to describe and not ignore the elephants in the room. I'm gonna introduce them now, and each will make a short opening statement, then we'll have some brief panel discussion here, and then we'll open it up to the whole room, elephants included. You can send your questions or comments up uh, on cards. Uh, which will be passed out very shortly. I think many of them have been passed out. Our first presenter, our first panelist, many of you know her as the host and executive producer of the wonderful program out of KPFK Los Angeles Pacifica. It's the Uprising radio show. It's Sonali Kohatkar. She's been doing solidarity work with Afghan women since 2000, before the 9-11 attacks, before the US invasion and occupation. She's visited Afghanistan and it led to a book uh, called Bleeding Afghanistan, Washington Warlords and the Propaganda of Silence. Sonali has a master's of science degree in astrophysics from the University of Hawaii. Anyone else in the room that has that degree? Yeah, I didn't think so. She's very unique. She also has a two-month-old baby. Let's welcome Sonali. Thank you, Jeff. A two-month-old and a five-year-old. Um, so I want to address a few of the, the major issues that journalists struggle with when covering, in particular, the Afghanistan war, the first of the wars on terror and the longest war that the U.S. has ever fought and the war that I'm most familiar with. Um, and most of the coverage of the Afghanistan war isn't terribly unique. It's similar to the coverage, of course, that other U.S. wars have gotten. Doesn't question very much the government's rhetoric and motives and doesn't pay much attention to how those most affected by our policies uh, think and feel about the war. We're all familiar today with the case that was made initially for invading and occupying Afghanistan in 2001. We were told it was a moral imperative to free Afghans from the uh, tyranny of the Taliban while simultaneously exacting revenge for the 9-11 attacks. And at that time, of course, mainstream media did a stellar job of simply echoing the Bush administration's line uh, about uh, the invasion and occupation. And I remember the jingoism was so thick at the time that an essay published by a University of uh, Texas journalism professor Robert Jensen, critical of the war in the Houston Chronicle, was met with such a mob of angry responses that it threatened to derail his academic career. And his piece was, of course, quite the exception in the mainstream media. In the independent media, uh, people like, I remember, of course, Howard Zinn, the late great Howard Zinn, and so many others were criticizing the rush to war. Uh, but in the mainstream media, that Houston Chronicle essay by Jensen was one of the exceptions. Uh, then, of course, after the Taliban fell, journalists rarely questioned 
questioned what the U.S. government did in Afghanistan by installing the Northern Alliance warlords into the post-Taliban government. Um, if anyone questioned this, the wisdom of empowering these criminal warlords, they were countered with the notion of we want peace before justice. Um, and uh, the New York Times, uh, in particular, I remember, had this glowing piece about the Northern Alliance and their quest for women's rights uh, and painted them as feminist compared to the Taliban. And we, of course, know how feminist they are today. Um, but there was almost no coverage of what on-the-ground activists inside Afghanistan were saying about the Northern Alliance, about these men that the U.S. was very happy to put into power. There were desperate appeals to not uh, give them government positions. Uh, there was a statement put out by RAWA, the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan, that I've worked closely with since 2000. Um, and they're the oldest women's rights organization in Afghanistan. They put out a statement right away saying that was entitled, the people of Afghanistan do not accept domination of the Northern Alliance. And needless to say, of course, they didn't get quoted in the New York Times. Um, near the end of the Bush era and the beginning of the Obama administration, there was a lot of talk, of course, about increasing troops to Afghanistan before we can decrease them. Um, and this troop surge got a lot of news coverage. It certainly did. Um, it was pretty uh, well discussed in terms of the amount of coverage that it got. But uh, most of the uh, coverage centered on things like how effective the troop surge was going to be, uh, whether there were enough troops put, uh, that were going to be put in place. And there are many, many examples of that, but one that comes to mind was the New York Times' publishing of Max Boots' editorial that made a moral argument for why there should be more troops. Uh, Forbes.com went as far as to say that uh, 40,000 extra troops was not nearly enough. Um, there were very few outlets beyond the Guardian newspaper uh, in Britain, as Jeff was saying, you know, the, the mainstream outlets of our allies had much more critical coverage. The Guardian newspaper, uh, in fact, dared to publish the piece, uh, the op-ed by the very prominent uh, Afghan women's rights activist Malalai Joya, who I've also worked closely with, and her op-ed was simply titled, A Troop Surge Can Only Magnify the Crime Against Afghanistan, and the U.S. outlets did not publish that. Another major strategy of the U.S. government has, of course, um, that has is, that is very significantly marked the Afghan war on the ground have been these deadly night raids um, where American soldiers have gone in and raided Afghan villages, um, arrested, detained, tortured men and, uh, and boys and women. And of course, there was a lot of coverage of the deadly shooting, mass shooting by Staff Sergeant Robert Bales that seemed to bring to light and open the eyes of the mainstream media that these night raids were even happening. But aside from that one incident, almost you know, no critical coverage of the vast majority of night raids that terrorize uh, Afghans um, and the protests against these night raids on the ground. There uh, were exceptions like the independent journalist Anand Gopal, who's based, uh, who has been based in Afghanistan. He wrote extensively about the chilling effects of the night raids, um, and he wrote that on TomDispatch.com, another you know, very uh, important independent media outlet. He's been one of the uh, few independent journalists covering directly what ordinary Afghan reactions are to the war. Uh, and then, of course, we have the drone strikes, which once upon a time were common uh, mostly in the border region between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but today are becoming increasingly more and more relied upon inside Afghanistan as we begin to draw down troops. And while there has been coverage of the drone program, in fact, there has been extensive coverage of the drone program in mainstream media, most of it has been focused on how effective it is or whether it's legal or not, not whether it's moral or not, uh, or not what the actual effects on those who have these uh, bombs rained upon them uh, has been. Uh, there's one exception in the mainstream media that I do want to call out, and that's Kathy Gannon, who writes for Associated Press, and she's actually one of the few mainstream journalists that has done very good work on Afghanistan. She's mostly because she's been covering it for decades uh, in Afghanistan and living there. And she wrote a, a piece that was the exception rather than the rule uh, that was titled Afghan Villagers Flee Homes Blame U.S. Drones. And in it, she actually went as far as quoting ordinary Afghans who were living in villages that were affected by drone strikes. 
And just for a moment on when Afghans are quoted, even when journalists do interview Afghans, they often do so with very little regard to who the Afghans are. Um, and I've had firsthand experience of this myself. I get calls from journalists all the time requesting interviews about what's happening inside Afghanistan. Um, often they mistake me for being Afghan. And then when I tell them, well, no, I'm not Afghan, I'm Indian, sometimes the interviews get canceled. They want authentic Afghan voices but it doesn't matter what kind of Afghans, any Afghan will do. Um, I've sometimes had to correct uh, broadcasters on live interviews when they've mistakenly referred to me as Afghan. Um, but uh, they don't care who they interview. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a US educated Afghan American who's worked in the Karzai administration versus uh, an Afghan activist on the ground living uh, you know, in, 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 the, in their communities and uh, experiencing firsthand the effects of, of, of the US policies and organizing with all the risks involved, it doesn't matter, any Afghan will do, and that's quite similar to, of course, the U.S. approach to installing Afghans in power. Any Afghan will do, just put them in power um, and call them representative of all Afghans. Um, and there's no distinguishing between Afghans of different economic classes, different motivations, political motivations, different perspectives, and it leads to a lot of misunderstanding and mistaken reporting on how Afghans view the U.S. war and invasion. And it's a form of racism, you know? Any, I mean, if somebody wanted to come and cover the Occupy Wall Street movement from outside um, and just grab the first American they could find and call it representative, their view representative of all Americans, it might be a very skewed view of what's actually happening. Um, and finally, one of the most difficult questions that I think journalists grapple with here is over what the consequences of the impending U.S. withdrawal will be. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the infamous Time magazine cover of August 2010 that gratuitously showed the uh, face of the young Afghan woman, Bibi Aisha, whose nose had been cut off by the Taliban. And the headline said, what happens if we leave Afghanistan? It should have more accurately said, what is happening while we are occupying Afghanistan? Um, but uh, in any case, it's a question that few journalists have been able to grapple with, at least in the mainstream. And it's it's true, the misogynists are going to be emboldened once the U.S. forces leave. But the context of that mess is, is, is greatly oversimplified. It hasn't taken into account how the U.S. has empowered misogynist warlords as a deliberate war strategy on the ground. Um, and, and it also hasn't taken into account what anti-fundamentalist activists would like to do uh, and see and do in their own country. And many of the women that I work closely with would, would rather achieve women's rights uh, on their own, knowing full well the destruction that Western emancipation or attempted emancipation of women in Afghanistan has really been like. So unless there is deep and nuanced journalism, um, an investigation of who is supporting whom for what reason, what the real effects of our policies are uh, to those who are most directly affected, uh, we're not really going to know what's happening in Afghanistan and what will happen in the future. There, there really needs to be a distinguishing of, of, of who, um, of, of, between those who claim to espouse human rights and women's rights while preserving the status quo and those who actually want freedom for women, men, children, freedom of the press, um, freedom from foreign occupation and invasion, in other words, real democracy. And those are two different sets of people um, with some overlap, but, uh, but in general, two fairly distinct groups. And, and that said, of course, the challenges facing Afghan journalists inside Afghanistan far outweigh any concerns that American journalists face. And I, I didn't want to uh, end without mentioning how difficult it is today to be an, a journalist inside Afghanistan, doubly more difficult if you're a woman journalist. Um, Afghan journalists who do distinguish between you know, activists and those who are in power, they live the reality. They see firsthand who the perpetrators of violence are, and they report on it. And for that, they face a dizzying array of decrees that make it very difficult for them to do their work. And worse, they're often imprisoned and tortured by the US-backed Afghan government or hunted down and murdered by the Taliban, like Zakia Zaki, who was this uh, woman journalist who started Radio Peace in Afghanistan. She was shot uh, in bed in the middle of the night with her toddler a few years ago, and it's not clear who uh, assassinated her because she was critical of both the Taliban and the US-backed government, and she's one of dozens of journalists that are uh, killed in Afghanistan each year. If Afghan journalists can courageously cover with depth and nuance what's really happening with very real risk to their lives, then I think American journalists can do far better than what they've been doing so far. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali. Our next guest, next speaker.
is Marjorie Cohn, columnist, author, longtime criminal defense attorney, professor at the Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Diego. She's a past president of the National Lawyers Guild. She testified before Congress in 2008 about the Bush administration's torture policy. She's testified as an expert witness at military hearings about war illegality and the duty to disobey unlawful orders. Her latest book is The United States and Torture, and her upcoming book is about drones and so-called targeted killings. Marjorie Cohn. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to all my fellow panelists. I'm just de delighted to be here with you all today. With so many places to get information, all claiming to have the truth, there is no objective truth. During the Vietnam War, there were three networks. There was no cable, there was no internet. Every city had a Democratic newspaper and a Republican newspaper. Even if they disagreed, there was a general core belief and perception. Until 1968, the media dutifully served the government's narrative of the war. That was until the Tet Offensive in 1968, when the National Liberation Front attacked all the major cities and 44 provincial uh, capitals and took over control of two-thirds of the country of Vietnam. Right after Tet was reported, no serious person could believe that the war could be won. Walter Cronkite went to Vietnam and said, this war is a stalemate. <clears throat> he was the most trusted man in news. The anti-war movement led to questioning of the entire society, mores, culture, music, free love, drugs, the distribution of power. Today, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have been monumental failures by any objective standard, but it took years to get a consensus against the Iraq war. We've expanded coverage, we've diversified coverage, but so has the other side. With the proliferation of cable TV, the left got more channels and so did the right. And the channels have become corporate. News has become opinion. Analysis has become a cover for opinion. There are big rewards for pundits who are paid by the cable channels. But hard reporting, journalism, suffers because it's not as dramatic as taking extreme positions on policy matters. Now a, re a reporter covering the war has a hard, harder time creating consensus because this, the society is so polarized. There's such a diversity of opinions on public issues, there is no truth. The political polarization prevents a national consensus on issues of war and peace. We don't have a draft which made a huge difference in turning public opinion against the Vietnam War. The problem is reaching people who don't go on left websites or TV or radio. In many ways, we're preaching to the choir. But many on the left don't like to hear criticism of Obama, and that's another cha challenge that we face. Lo <laughs> Lawrence... <clears throat> Lawrence O'Donnell pointed out that all of the cable news stations combined are watched by only 1% of the viewers. So the fraction of viewers watching Fox, MSNBC, and CNN, it, it's kind of a meaningless number in terms of the politics of the country. Rachel Maddow can't have the impact of a Walter Cronkite because we're talking about one-third of 1%, MSB, MSNBC generally uh, roughly being one-third of 1%. Cronkite would raise issues and Congress would hold hearings. That's both positive and negative because pushing a story to get those who care about it to pick it up also galvanizes the opposition. An issue resonates with millions of people who see it on the TV news. Now it's gone unless it's covered by everyone. The alternative media has some effect on the corporate media. For example, torture led to some hearings, but it never became central on the public agenda. Now, as has been mentioned, drones are becoming a big issue, not because we're illegally killing people in other countries off the battlefield, but because a white paper was leaked that indicates the government may kill U.S. citizens on U.S. soil. Because the Bush administration and now the Obama administration through the corporate media have been so successful in terrorizing the American public about the so-called threat of terrorism, most people don't care 
about foreigners being killed. And much of the terrorism propaganda is fueled by racism. Of the 366 US drone attacks that have killed 3,581 people in Pakistan since 2002, 316 were launched by the Obama administration. Less than 2% of those killed were high profile Taliban militants. Most of them were civilians. Since 9-11, there have been no official figures on how many people have been killed by drone strikes, drone strikes and, and other kinds of targeted killing by other means because of the extreme secrecy. Lindsey Graham's figure is 4,700 people killed by drone strikes, only four of whom were US citizens. For a long time, independent media and anti-war activists criticized the drone war. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism documents civilian casualties. Gradually, generals like McChrystal, former diplomats, foreign policy experts, are talking about blowback from drones, about the inadvisability, about the political fallout from drones. The leak of the white paper and Rand Paul's filibuster focused attention on the killing of US citizens, not on the killing of other people. And the House Judiciary Committee held hearings, but again, just focused on US citizens, although targeted killings, not just drones. A Gallup poll that was released about two weeks ago showed that 65% of Americans think we should use drone strikes in other countries against suspected terrorists. That number goes down to 41% of people who favor strikes in other countries against US citizens living abroad. And it goes down to 25% who favor strikes against suspected terrorists living in the United States. But only 13% of the people surveyed believe that we should, um, we should use drone strikes against US citizens in the United States. But when many Americans think of US citizens, they don't think of people who look like Awalaki and his son, his young son, they think of white people. Now, when we, we, we all know about the hype of weapons of mass destruction. Many of us were covering it at the time, saying this is not, uh, this is not a reality. We should not rush to war. We should not go to war. There's no reason to. We're seeing a similar kind of hype with the chemical weapons uh, narrative uh, by, by the Syrian government. And, and this may, may well lead to an attack on Syria when we saw um, Obama recently in Israel, his big signature um, uh, victory was getting Israel to apologize to Turkey for the, uh, the killing of nine um, Turks in the, uh, in the flotilla. Okay, I'm, I'm wrapping up. In conclusion, two pieces of advice for independent journalists. Keep your head down and don't believe what government officials tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. That's also the advice that we got from the late Izzy Stone. Our next panelist is Izzy Award winner and host and executive producer of Democracy Now! Amy Goodman. Amy has built up one of the most important daily newscasts in the history of our country. Few other news sources cover issues of war and peace, human rights, civil liberties as doggedly as Democracy Now! She also has a weekly syndicated column. Her fifth and latest book, this one with Dennis Moynihan, is The Silenced Majority, Stories of Uprisings, Occupations, Resistance, and Hope. She'll be signing books right after this panel out in the exhibit hall, along with Dennis Moynihan, Juan Gonzalez, and Joe Torres. Amy Goodman. Thank you, Jeff. It's an honor to be here with all of my colleagues and to be here at the National Conference on Media Reform. Media reform is critical right now, and especially on this weekend. 45 years ago, April 4th, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was gunned down in Memphis, Tennessee. He had gone there to organize with sanitation workers. For that crime, he had lost his life. A year to the day before he was killed, April 4th, 1967, Dr. King spoke at Riverside Church in New York City. 
and he uttered those words about the country he loved, about the United States, that it's the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. He was speaking out against the Vietnam War, something even his closest inner circle warned him against, said, you got the Voting Rights Act, you have the most powerful person on earth on your side, referring to President Johnson, you got the Civil Rights Act, you got him to agree with you, why would you alienate him now? But Dr. King said this was all a seamless web, his concern about human rights at home and abroad. And for the next year, he was increasingly outspoken about war. The response of the media, from the New York Times to the Washington Post to Time Magazine, decrying what he said in that Riverside Church address, calling it propaganda that sounded like it was from Hanoi and that he was doing a disservice to his people, to his cause. I think we have to look back 45 years ago and assess where we are today 45 years later. Where is the media today? How would they govern Dr. King's message today? When the Iraq War began, March 19, 2003, a few weeks before FAIR, the organization that Jeff Cohen founded, co-founded, did a study of the two weeks around then Secretary of State General Colin Powell giving his push for war at the UN, February 5, 2003. A speech he would later call, General Powell would later call, a stain on his career. That speech was the final nail in the coffin for so many because he had been hesitant about the war, so he had a great deal of credibility. And he said, yes, the evidence was in. There was, there were, there was final proof that there were weapons of mass destruction. Fair did a study of the two weeks around that address and looked at the four major nightly newscasts, the ABC World News Tonight, CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News, and the PBS NewsHour. In that two-week period, six weeks before the invasion, you know, these are the agenda setters. And this was extremely significant because this was the period when Americans are making up their minds. About half the population was for the war, half opposed to war. In those two weeks, there were 393 interviews done around war in the four major nightly newscasts. Guess how many were with anti-war leaders? Well, you figure, you know, half the population four, half against, maybe 200, 150, three. Three of almost 400. That is no longer a mainstream media. That's an extreme media beating the drums for war. That is a disservice to a democratic society. I really do think that those who are deeply concerned about war, those who are concerned about the growing inequality in this country, those who are concerned about climate change, about the fate of the planet, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. You know, the Democracy Now! team and my colleagues are here filming and interviewing people, and it's wonderful to be part of a team of people. And my colleagues in the broader Pacifica family, like Sonali, we came into Denver a few days ago, and we came into the airport, and there were some soldiers there from Buckley, and they were picking up a general who was coming into town, and they waved. I, I thought they were waving at the general behind me. I thought there was a general there. But I came back, and they were in uniform, and I said to them, do you know democracy now? Yes, ma'am, they said. I said, do you watch every day, ma'am? So I said, why? They said, it's objective, because you're talking about war. It isn't about whether you're for the war or against the war. It's that we cover war. It is on the front pages, if you will, of, the, of Democracy Now!, even though it is a radio and TV daily grassroots global broadcast. You can read it as well. There is no more serious decision a country can make than go to war, and whether you agree with it or not, we must cover this every day. 
every day. Um, you know, yesterday, a great heroine was in our midst here, Carlotta Walls Lanier, the youngest of the Little Rock Nine, right? September 25th, 1957 it was, that she and eight other young students, she was 14 years old, stood up to an angry mob of a thousand people as she walked into Central High in Little Rock to get an education, surrounded by National Guard. And um, when she was here speaking yesterday, she said she was inspired then what were the lessons she learned? She was inspired by the story of Emmett Till, a young 14-year-old boy who had died two years before she did this. In the summer of 1955, his mother, Mamie Till, in Chicago had sent um, her son, Emmett, 14 years old, just like Carlotta, had sent him to get out of the city for the summer, and he went to Money, Mississippi, was sleeping in his aunt and uncle's house with his cousins, and he was ripped out of bed by a white mob, and they tortured him, they beat, it, beat, they beat him, and he ended up in the bottom of the Tallahatchie River. His body was dredged up, sent back to Chicago for the funeral. His mother, Mamie, was not an activist at that time, but she understood something very deep. She want, said she wanted the casket of Emmett open for the wake and the funeral. She wanted the world to see the ravages of racism and the brutality of bigotry. Thousands streamed by his casket and saw, and then Jet Magazine and other black publications, the kind of publications that Carlotta Walls Lanier yesterday here at the National Conference for Media Reform, the same publications that she said were covering her issues. She described a group of black journalists who dared to cover the Little Rock Nine being beaten, one of them almost to death. He died two years later, and he was a former Marine because he was black, a black reporter. How brave these reporters were. But here was Mamie Till. She wasn't a reporter, but she understood how important it was for the world to see the images. And so Jet Magazine published the images of his distended, mutilated head and they were actually published and they were seared into the history and consciousness of this country. Mamie Till had something to, very important to teach all of us today, to teach the press today. Show the pictures, show the images. Could you imagine if for just one week we saw the images of war? Every day, the top of every report we did the corporate media did, the independent media did, every top of every radio and television newscast on everyone's Facebook wall, in a sense, everyone is a journalist. Every story was about a soldier dead or dying, a woman with her legs blown off, either by a cluster bomb or a drone attack. If the top story above the fold of every surviving newspaper in this country showed a baby dead on the ground with an actual story naming her, telling us the story of her family for just one week. If every tweet, if every email told one of these stories, Americans are a compassionate people. They would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. Democracy Now! Thank you so much, Amy. Our final panelist is Norman Solomon. He's the author or co-author of a dozen books, including the memoir, Made Love, Got War, and the landmark book, War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death, which became a documentary movie. As the founder and director of the Institute for Public Accuracy, Norman led three uh, peace-seeking trips to Iraq before the US invasion, and he also led a couple fact-finding missions to Iran and Afghanistan. For 17 years, he wrote a nationally syndicated column of media criticism, and now he writes a weekly column focused on politics for websites such as Common Dreams and Truth Out. In 2010, Norman and I co-founded the online activism group Roots Action 
www.nobelpeacebrizecommittee.org, which currently is circulating the petition to the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, urging that they give this year's Peace Prize to the military whistleblower, Bradley Manning. Norm Well, we're gathering here in a political context that includes one major political party has given faith a bad name, and the other major political party has given hope a bad name. <laughs> but the reality is that we can't get very far or move very far forward if we don't have faith, a secular faith at least, in democracy and we can't get very far without hope that the human capacity to care for each other and work together is going to create a better world. And I think faith in democracy and hope in the possibilities for creating a better world need to imbibe themselves and incubate and grow in journalism and in journalists and their institutions. War thrives on abstraction and propaganda. I.F. Stone said that sometimes it's so exciting to work on a story that you can forget that the house is really burning. Jackson Brown reminded us that there are lives in the balance, that there are people not only under fire but are suffering and living and dying the consequences among other things, are the failures of journalism to serve the interests of the public rather than serving the interests of the state and corporate power. And when we look at the context that we're living in today, it's got to be said and acknowledged and confronted that we live in a warfare state that, contrary to the assertions of claims of aspirations of our current president, in his second inaugural address, belief in and commitment to perpetual war is central to what the U.S. government is about, and acceptance of that perpetual war is central to what the mainline media of this country are about. The near virtual consensus that crosses the aisle on Capitol Hill for the so-called war on terror mirrors and is mirrored by the mass media, the corporate-owned media, the purportedly public media that you will hear on All Things Considered in Morning Edition and the PBS NewsHour. And that so-called war on terror has become the wallpaper of the echo chamber now for almost a dozen years. We've lived, if we've lived very long, through one war after another for decades in this country, aided and abetted by what passes for journalism. And if we go and look at what war thrives on, and we look at abstraction, certainly part of that is the basis for the ongoing war of this warfare state which crosses and recognizes no boundaries or calendars. War as an abstraction is based on two tiers of grief, theirs and ours, the inconsequential and the profound an apartheid of emotional valuation of human beings that grinds the lens through which tinted red, white, and blue, we are encouraged to see the world every day by our mass media. That is a reality that is combined with the propaganda aspect, overtly what George Orwell described as doublethink, where what would we think if it was done to us? What would we think of if another country exercised impunity to send crews and drone aerial vehicles across our borders to strike at will. The late Senator Wayne Morse, who believed in international law, 
was among the few in Congress during the buildup to the Vietnam War who challenged that kind of impunity. And that kind of impunity has been normalized by the warfare state and the state of journalism of the mass media of our country. The media's relationship with the warfare state is central to the plowing of huge quantities of resources, financial, industrial, and human, into warfare. While meanwhile, our cities are dying, as Dr. King said. The bombs in Vietnam exploded home. The cruise missiles fired on Pakistan are exploding in our own country where we can't and don't provide health care education, housing, helping children, helping the elderly, while our lauded president, the neoliberal president, now is slashing against the core of a social compact with Social Security and Medicare, part of the warfare state. The antidote to those poisons is independent journalism. We're here at this conference, I believe, and people around the country are working every day very hard to sustain those possibilities, to make them more real, to make them more vibrant, so that we can serve that antidote to the warfare state and create something that is worthy of, worthy of the term journalism. You know, if you use the metaphor of the body politic, you know, what happens to the human body without circulation? You have blockage, you have coronaries, and our potential democracy here is suffering grievously from the blockages, the failure of circulation of ideas and information and freewheeling debate. Here we are with the imperative to challenge the compulsion, the compuls compulsive disorder, the spin cycle for war, and now it's hard to keep track of the various phases that we're in. You can't withdraw from Afghanistan, quote unquote, too fast. That's one part of the spin cycle. Another is the slow burn of building the agenda for war or attack on Iran. Another is the double think that tries to justify the scenario of a possible attack on North Korea. Can you imagine if war games were undertaken next to and along the borders of the United States of America, including simulating a nuclear attack, what our reaction would be in this country. And yet the paranoia of the North Korean regime is being fed and fueled by the double standards that are also inherent in US media coverage. Whether to Iran or North Korea, again and again, ratified, ratcheted up, amplified by the main line media in this country. Do as we say, not as we do. Well, I've, and you as well, have probably encountered, that's not very convincing. When I met people in Afghanistan or Iran, not very convincing. Do as we say, not as we do. People pay attention not to the rhetoric, but to the reality. And let me close on this note. A challenge of journalism and a challenge of civic engagement holds a special responsibility to scrutinize the actions of our own government and the consequences. It's not only that we should cover those actions and those consequences, but we have a special responsibility to especially make sure that we cover those actions and those consequences that we can build attention to independent journalism that says, as American journalists, as American citizens, we're not going to accept a double standard, that we will watchdog and bird dog and scrutinize and challenge the actions of our own government. You know, as we contemplate this war world that we live in, Often, I think, as we try to track often overwhelming news, it can feel 
very disoriented sometimes, like maybe we are losing our bearings, losing our, our sense of core. And quite often we might feel, well, what is the through line? What, is, what keeps us going? And I, I believe that human rights has to be a single standard that helps us to not get lost, to not have the abstractions of coverage or the propaganda of coverage blow us off course. There's an expression among some musicians, you may feel like you're getting lost, but you won't if you know the blues. And I think we may feel we're getting lost, but we won't if we have a single standard of human rights. If we remember that when Martin Luther King Jr. denounced the madness of militarism, unfortunately what he spoke of was not just about what was occurring in 1967, but what's occurring right now. Right now, the U.S. government continues with impunity to assert its prerogative with its military might to wage war across boundaries as it wishes. What's up for grabs is whether we can insist on living in a democracy, not as people who tune into the news, but civically engaged people who create it for the better. Thank you, Norman Solomon. Uh, I want to just ask a quick question for final comments. We've, a bunch of us have touched on it already, and that's the problem of journalists putting partisanship ahead of principle. And that's the idea if you have a president that you prefer over the other guy, and that president's in power, that perhaps you mute, mute your voice. Any final comments on that problem? We're all journalists up here. Uh, well, I remember, is this on? I remember when, uh, Michael Moore wrote an open letter to President Obama about the escalation of the Afghan war as if it was a surprise. Um, and, and, you know, I'm of course greatly respect Michael's work and, and everything he does, but I think many on the left were mistakenly caught off guard by Obama's escalation of the Afghanistan war. He campaigned on it. That was the central um, central aspect of his foreign policy platform when he first ran for office was escalating the Afghan war while drawing down the Iraq war. And, and I think, you know, we shouldn't have been in any way surprised, saddened, disappointed uh, when he did exactly that in that one sense. You know, he's broken many promises, but he kept that one promise that he, that he made. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, I, I also want to mention that in, in when I was talking about the, the folks who did do very good coverage of the Afghanistan war when it was first um, unfolding and, and is still unfolding, I mean, Amy interviewed Rawa members and Malalai Joya. She interviewed myself and my co-author and, and uh, Pacifica Radio was, was really there uh, among independent journalists who did the kind of coverage and, and have continued to do it under Obama. So. Anyone else want to make a final comment? I, I know Jeremy Scahill, as soon as Obama was elected, yeah. at the bottom of his articles in his bio, he would write, Jeremy Scahill pledges to be the same journalist under an Obama administration that he was during Bill Clinton and George Bush's presidencies. And uh, Jeremy talks about how he got some of the most vicious hate mail from Democrats more so than all the years he was exposing Bush and Bush's torture and on and on. All right, question from the audience. Um, Nobody else wants to be critical of the, of the Democrats. I, I, I send up the question. Um, the, uh, I think everyone here has been critical of the Democrats, but the, the question from the floor was, uh, here as active citizens, and a bunch of you are journalists, and a bunch of you are bloggers, what do we encourage people here to do to build independent media, to challenge mainstream media? What are specific things that we call on our, our active people here and our bloggers and journalists to do? to do your job, to dig deep. It is not about who is president. 
whether the president is a Republican, a Democrat, maybe someday in the future an independent or a green, who knows. Um, it's about going beyond the words, and so much of politics today is debating what is meant by particular words. It is our job to evaluate the actions. And also, most importantly, not just to give voice to those in power, but to be there at the target end, especially here in the United States as American journalists of US foreign policy. You know, the week of the 10th anniversary of the Iraq war, we did special programming all week. I didn't think what we did would be that revolutionary to have one day Ra'ed Gerar on, an Iraqi American blogger, and the next day to have Yanar, Yanar Muhammad on, uh, who is an Iraqi um, woman, feminist, activist, deeply concerned about what's happening in her country. And make no mistake about it, for Iraqis, the war is not over right now. Um, I didn't think that was such a big deal. But when you look at the rest of the media in this country, to hear an Iraqi voice was highly unusual. Mm -hmm. And yet that is our job, is to go to where the silence is. What is their assessment of their country right now, 10 years later? We just have to get back to basic principles of good journalism. Let people speak for themselves. Provide a forum for them to debate and discuss the most important issues of the day and tell their stories when they cannot, until they can tell their own. And, and those basic principles have to include independent, independence from the state, from those uh, in the executive, legislative, uh, and uh, uh, judicial branches. And the, the failures uh, have involved just failures uh, to do that. I mean, if you look at what we have suffered from in terms of journalism uh, in our lifetimes, uh, We've seen perpetual deference uh, to those in power. And um, this sort of segues back as well to the previous question. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes uh, to watch Fox News. It's also very difficult sometimes to watch MSNBC for the same reasons. Because in both cases, those networks are dominated by journalists and commentators who uh, genuflect towards the leaders of one major political party and villainize uh, the leaders of the other. That's not journalism. It's not even a balanced array of any semblance of debate. I think the other part of the answer to that question is we need to build and sustain our independent media outlets, TV, radio, online websites, uh, independent producers of documentaries, that requires institutional support from individuals, foundations, all sorts of configurations so that we have the capacity to build our own independent media while we confront and challenge the mainline media. I just wanted to add one uh, uh, um, example, um, sort of to broaden out what um, you're saying, Norman. The example of the Keystone XL pipeline, you know, and. If you think that that doesn't relate to war, it does. Um, because what is the Keystone XL pipeline about? It's bringing this very dirty tar sands oil from Alberta and Canada down to the Gulf. Uh, why? Well, it's about the tremendous hunger for fossil fuels. And think about why we wage wars. You know, the joke of the little kid um, talking about Iraq, uh, turning to his dad and saying, what's our oil doing under their sand? Um, but if you look at, just go back a few weeks ago, there was the largest environmental protest in history in Washington, D.C. Um, I tuned into MSNBC that night to look at the coverage. You know, they do, they cover what's happening in the world, and, you know, especially on that day, each day, um, digesting the news. I did not see, I didn't watch it nonstop all night, but I watched a lot of it a reference to this environmental protest because it was protesting the Obama administration. 
right now, President Obama is in the midst of deciding, uh, you know, whether to allow the Keystone XL pipeline to uh, be built. Um, and there's this Exxon Mobil oil spill in Arkansas. I tuned to MSNBC to see how they were covering it. They did talk about it. They did talk about the oil spill that's right outside a Little Rock right now that's sort of drowned a subdivision in Mayflower, Arkansas. But did they go as far as to talk about this is happening in the midst of President Obama making this imminent decision about the larger Keystone XL pipeline? If you tune to Fox, they would cover the environmental protests. They would just slam it. But at least you know what happened. You can read between the lines. Yeah. yeah, I just want to pick up on what Amy was talking about, uh, two things during her talk and also in the, in the Q&A, about um, the impact of showing images of people, for example, in Iraq being killed and telling the stories, showing the targets of these policies and, and um, also uh, letting them tell their stories and telling their stories. Um, during the Civil Rights Movement, David Halberstam writes about the power of television when, um, the, when, when people, when, when black people were being hosed down with fire hoses and how that, that, that image and the Im images of these, these very, very peaceful um, children integrating uh, the, the um, uh, high school. Um, and, and how that really turned public opinion in favor of the, the civil rights um, movement. Um, during Vietnam, one of the things in addition to the draft, the tremendous anti-war movement and the GI movement, which was, which was central to that movement, um, what really affected people were seeing the body bags coming back. And of course, we haven't seen body bags uh, coming back from the Iraq and Afghan wars. Um, when I got to Stanford as a freshman, I was, you know, red hot pep club cheerleader, all of that. And my f beginning of my freshman year, I went to uh, I went to the student union and saw this this film. It was a grainy black and white film, and uh, it was that image of that young girl y naked running from the napalm after after she had uh, after it had been dropped by by an American bomb. And you know the the uh, the decision I made to get involved in the anti-war movement was not an intellectual one. It was a visceral one. It just struck me that oh my God, is this what we're doing? And so I think it's important to show those images, tell those stories, but also not shun away from stories that may not be popular with everyone on the left, such as what Israel is doing to the Palestinians. That, that was indeed a couple of the comments on these cards, this coverage of Israel and Palestinians. While we're on the subject of images, let's remember that what pushed Martin Luther King over the edge where he said, I have to break my silence and speak out against the Vietnam War, and he ended up being probably the, most the single most powerful individual voice against the Vietnam War. He saw the images of, women, of young kids victims of napalm in Vietnam, and he saw those mm -hmm. images in an independent radical magazine called Ramparts. Mm -hmm. It's really, mm -hmm. he's, he talked about it at length, about how he couldn't stay silent anymore. When it comes to what people out here can do, and that was on a couple of these cards. Jeff, I just want, yes. for the exact quote, uh, responding to that speech he gave at Riverside Church, Time Magazine called the speech demagogic slander that sounded like a script for Radio Hanoi. The Washington Post said King, quote, diminished his usefulness to his cause, his country, his people. One of the actions that people can take out here that are interested in an organized challenge of mainstream media bias, whether it's Israel, Palestine, Afghanistan, is to join the activist list at fair.org. Sign up for it. They go after the media outlets that can be moved, National Public Radio, New York Times, Washington Post. How many of you are already on the list of fair.org? If you're interested in media activism, you all should be on that list. Uh, can I ask how many have signed up for democracynow.org? We send you our daily digest headlines and uh, news reports and just check it out because it's also the transcript and send it around to people. And that's for everyone here, for Sonali show uprisings. It's very important as you talk about building media, Jeff. 
is that we take or independent, I'm not even gonna say, it shouldn't be the alternative. As I said, I mean, the corporate media is the extreme media. I really do think independent media represents the mainstream in this country today. And we must build and protect independent media uh, because that is the, um, really the hope of the future. How do we get more balanced coverage of Israel-Palestine issues in mainstream media? For your information, it is now strongly tilted in favor of Israel, quote unquote. Uh, any comments? I mean, all of you have done uh, great work on that subject. Yes. It's all about a single standard of human rights. And I think if you um, insist on a single standard, the uh, reflexive uh, devaluation of Palestinian lives that has for so long so perniciously dominated U.S. mass media will be challenged directly. Uh, you know, it's one thing for a president to talk about seeing uh, things through somebody else's eyes as sort of a, a toss-off rhetorical statement. Another a thing to, on a day-in, day-out basis, uh, not through platitudes, but through coverage and through public discourse, to say that we have a single standard of human rights and of grief, that the suffering of a Palestinian is just as important as the suffering of an Israeli. I want to add, actually, I think that the tide is turning. I mean, uh, we may not see it in, in our media, but public opinion has actually probably shifted pretty significantly in terms of how Palestinians are viewed and the oppression of Palestinians are, are, is viewed. There have been some incredible successes recently on college campuses in particular with the divestment movement. Um, and uh, even if the mainstream media is not covering it, the public is getting it through social media networks. The challenge is, of course, getting our politicians to change the way they vote um, and, and, and convincing them that it's that you know that there's a not necessarily a political price for standing up to Israel but but I think public opinion on that one issue is seeing some slow change um, in a way that hasn't really happened in a, in a long time especially after Israel's recent incursions and, and uh, various invasions uh, in the past few years of both Lebanon and, and Palestinian territories uh, a few of us have talked about it. It led to a question. Do we think the mainstream uh, network news contributed to ending the Vietnam War? If so, what has changed in these intervening decades? Uh, you know, one of the great myths is that the mass media of the United States uh, somehow led the way to ending the Vietnam War. Au contraire, as they say, with usually better French accent than I do. Um, the reality is that the mass media of the United States had to be dragged kicking and screaming by the anti-war movement to begin to do decent coverage of the Vietnam War, just as has been the case in the last decade for these proliferating U.S. wars. Uh, Dan Hallen in his book, The Uncensored War, really documents that. And the, the mythology, you know, is uh, something that we need to challenge because it somehow can get us into, a, I think, a misleading frame of mind that if we can only convince the mass media to operate properly, that our job is done. Well, we must insist they do their job properly, but that has to be in tandem with building strong anti-war movements. And I think Amy's reading the quotes of how the mainstream media reacted when Martin Luther King came out against the Vietnam War. That was the overriding yes. bias. Right. Right. Until mm -hmm. 1968 or later, there was no... Uh, uh, anti-war voices that were allowed in a, any serious way into the mainstream. I think the best and way to... Sh one obtain. thing, I mean, I'm thinking of Danny Glover, who joked, but I think it's pretty serious. He wonders if Dr. Martin Luther King would be invited to the celebrations of his life anywhere in the country <laughs> yeah, today, really. when, you know, during, on uh, the federal holiday that people fought so hard for, for so many years. And another good symbol of the decline in mainstream media, think about how they reacted to the whistleblower or the military whistleblower in 1971 named Daniel Ellsberg who brings forward these documents. It was, if you've seen the movie about uh, Dan Ellsberg, the documentary, it almost amounted to civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. When one mainstream daily was stopped by a judge from publishing the Pentagon Papers, another daily picked it up. When they were stopped, a third mainstream daily picked mm -hmm. it up. Now look today at how they've reacted to the military whistleblower with documents named Bradley Manning. Mm -hmm. This 25-year-old who is facing life in prison 
who's revealed documents that were far more current, just completely broad, the Iraq war logs, the Afghan war logs, the US State Department, and the role they play in, in atrocities or covering up prosecutions in Europe against CIA officers who have engaged in torture and engaged in kidnapping. It's like night and day, the reaction of US media to these I think it's very important to talk about Bradley Manning. Think about this. Um, this is a young man who was uh, in the army in Iraq who downloads, uh, who now has said he uh, did download these documents and give them to WikiLeaks. Um, he has been held for three years without trial. Three years. When was the last time you heard his voice? Well, if you tune into Democracy Now!, you had to struggle to hear it, but that's only because we got a secret recording of him speaking in the courtroom. Why is his voice forbidden from being heard? He's behind bars. What threat is he in terms of for the US government? Why can't you hear what it is he has to say? Why is it so radical to bring you his voice, someone bravely in the courtroom, you know, secretly recording his statement uh, to the judge about why he did what he did. Um, Bradley Manning and Julian Assange. Julian Assange, who's holed up right now in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, who is facing extradition to Sweden, but who says he's not as concerned about going to Sweden as the possibility of then being extradited to the United States. Why would he be concerned? Well, does the word Bradley Manning ring a bell? Um, this is an extremely serious situation when you think of the stories that have come from these documents in a country where we are seeing a crackdown on information like we haven't seen before. The number of whistleblowers who are being prosecuted under the Obama administration, more whistleblowers being prosecuted today than in all past presidential administrations combined. The story of Bradley Manning is more than the story of this one young man. It is a message to all whistleblowers, and particularly, I think, young people in the military who went and have come back and saw atrocities, terrified to speak out because they're afraid could they face the same fate. It is our job as journalists to bring you this information. And so for all the bloggers, the journalists who are listening, who are watching, who will see this on C-SPAN um, and other um, global and national outlets, we have a responsibility. It is extremely serious. You know, the... Uh, Efforts to silence Bradley Manning, uh, ostensibly for the good of, uh, quote, national security, uh, are you know, metaphorically both uh, not uh, allowing uh, as much as possible, as the government would have it, his voice to be heard, uh, but also, of course, uh, his crime, quote unquote, was to inform the American public and the world about information that's supposed to be available to the consent of the governed, right? We're supposed to know what our government's doing in our names with our tax dollars. When it comes to media coverage, uh, with rare exceptions very dismissive in this country's mainline media towards Bradley Manning, I want to mention that about 10 days ago, RootsAction.org launched a petition asking the Norwegian Nobel Committee to award the Nobel Peace Prize to Bradley Manning. And we got coverage of that launch on Pacifica Radio in this country. None of the mainline media, National Public Radio would not touch it. Overseas media contacted us. And at this point, we have 40,000 people who've gone to rootsaction.org, and I won't be offended if you do it now with your uh, remote phone here, went to rootsaction.org already to sign that petition to the Nobel Committee. Bradley Manning epitomizes the meaning of the Nobel Peace Prize, just as Martin Luther King did. Sonali. Uh, I just want to touch on what you were saying earlier in terms of what has changed with the media landscape between then and now. And certainly as our mainstream media has gotten more and more consolidated, the views have become narrower. 
But what has also changed is our ability to be part of the media, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, we couldn't communicate with one another in the same way that we can now. I mean, believe it or not, journalists like myself will troll our Facebook pages to see what's trending and what our fellow activists are, are, are you know, seeing as important or reporting. And the nature of journalism has completely changed. I mean, every single one of you in this room is capable of spreading a story, of sparking uh, a, you know, a, a, the, the light under a, main, a media outlet to, to get that story heard. I mean, I have on my Facebook page, not just my fellow activists, but moms and dads from my kids' schools. And oftentimes, stuff that I post, uh, these folks who don't consider themselves activists pick up and, 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 you know, and say, here, here, and pass it on. And, and we have, all of us have the ability to do that in a way that just hasn't happened before. I mean, rootsaction.org is a website. Presente.org that got Lou Dobbs off the air was a website. These are all web-based strategies that are uh, blurring the lines between advocacy and journalism, if there was a line to begin with. And I think that's something that we should not, really not forget. I mean, despite how dismal the mainstream media landscape seems, the, the landscape of public media and what is considered uh, journalism and citizen journalism today is more exciting than ever. Which is why we have to keep the internet open and free and not let the cable companies and the telecoms write the legislation that would privatize this global, invaluable resource that allows us to communicate with each other all over the world. And I also just want to point out why it's hopeful to be here in Denver, Colorado. I mean, it's not just a figment of our, you know, optimistic imaginations that there is independent media. Um, this is a hotbed of independent media, Denver, as are many places around the country. You've got the wonderful community radio station, KGNU. Um, you have got um, Colorado Public Television and uh, Denver Open Media, uh, which is pioneering ways of putting together internet and public access. You've got on the Western Slope an amazing array of community stations from KGO to KBUT to, um, well, today I'll be going to a fundraiser for a new radio station that's just about to be established, KFFR. You can go to kffr.org. Juan Gonzalez and I will be there from 5.30 to uh, 7 at City of Cities, about six blocks from here during the NCMR dinner break. Um, new ones being established, Free Speech TV is based right here in Denver. And of course, there's Link TV um, that's based in Los Angeles, um, working now with KCET. Um, but all of this community media, Col Colorado Independent, I mean, here in Denver, you had Rocky Mountain News, a 150-year-old media institution that dies. So it becomes a one-paper town, the Denver Post. But no, the Colorado Independent pops up. Um, I think this isn't even uh, unique. All over the country, we have to open our eyes and work together and join these independent media spaces. And while we're talking about Colorado independent media, let's not forget alternative radio and oh David Barsamian. Oh my gosh, David Barsamian, that's right. Marjorie, you want to speak? Yeah, I want to make an announcement that the Freedom of Press Foundation is having an event on WikiLeaks, Bradley Manning, and Press Freedom today at 1 o'clock at Plaza Court 2 uh, in this building. And I think Amy said something so important. It's one of the centerpieces of this whole conference, which is the need to fight for net neutrality so these yeah. four companies that bring us our, our internet, which is AT&T, Verizon Wireless, Comcast, and Time Warner, those four companies uh, need to have legislation passed so that those four companies cannot have a two-tiered system where the the websites that they make money from or the websites that they own are in the fast lane and Democracy Now!, Sonali's uprising is pushed off into a slow lane. Hmm. When he was campaigning for president, pres uh, can candidate Barack Obama said, he take, I take a backseat to no one on the issue of net neutrality. We've had five years and his FCC Commission, commission chair has basically punted on the issue. It's one of the most important issues we have if we care about building up independent media. Okay. Uh, let's do a round of a few quick questions. One was 
Uh, what's the latest reports regarding the Guantanamo hunger strike, which is a central place in the war on terror, so-called, uh, and the U.S. military denying reporters access to the prison for at least a month? Anyone want to comment on that? Right. And Dana Green, the attorney who's involved. You need a mic. Yeah, a real <laughs> short comment. Yeah. <laughs> yes, David Reams is one of our co attorneys. He's assisting us with the trial of the century. Hedges at all versus Obama at all. How many here are familiar with Hedges at all versus Obama at all? That is frightening, folks. That has not been in our mess media. It has been covered on the front page over in the UK and The Guardian, and yet our papers have not covered this vital trial that some of the best journalists imaginable are, are multi-plaintiffs in this suit, plus a member of parliament from Iceland who protected Julian Assange. And we have had a uh, judge ruling in our favor and guess what last May happened? The judge was removed from the courtroom by Navy SEALs protecting her and from the courthouse. No big surprise. Our plaintiffs have had all kinds of threats and we are holding firm and what must we do as journalists and people who are active we must support, as David Reams does in Guantanamo, uh, very effectively. And he is now saying that it is increasing and that the starvation protest is increasing. And he okay. feels that perhaps some coverage is increasing also. So yeah, please hang in there, hang tough, raise Irish hell. Okay. Here. Just very quickly, uh, 166 men held at Guantanamo, the majority of them have been cleared for release, a number of them held for more than a decade. Um, we have reports that more, that perhaps nearly all, more than 100 are on hunger strike and have been for uh, many, many weeks now. You know, this again is our responsibility to cover. Um, what message does it send to countries, repressive regimes around the world, that the United States is holding scores of prisoners without charge who have been cleared by the U.S. for release and yet are being held indefinitely? Um, check out democracynow.org for all the latest. We cover this extensively. Also, I had the remarkable experience of interviewing Samuel Hajj in person. Uh, when we went to Doha for the climate change summit. Um, we went over to Al Jazeera, and he is the only journalist to have been held at Guantanamo. He was held by the US government for nearly seven years. He was never charged. And he was interrogated more than 100 times, most of those times as he was held. He was a cameraman going from Pakistan to Afghanistan when he was picked up. Most of the time that he was interrogated, he was questioned about the leadership of Al Jazeera, remarkably enough. And anyone who works for any news organization, any of the big ones, you know, CBS, NBC, ABC, how much do you know about your leaders? Um, but the fact that this has happened over and over again, um, it's our job to cover it. And the hunger strikers at Guantanamo are being force fed, where they take a tube, they stick it into their nose and down into their throats, excruciatingly painful, no anesthesia. And during the Bush administration, when they did that, they didn't sterilize the tubes between uses. So you could see the blood in the bile from the prior prisoner going into your own nose. And the United Nations had said that, that force feeding a person who understands the consequences of refusing food amounts to torture. This is going on right now under the Obama administration. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Norman's going to get the floor, and we're going to take final, quick final statements all the way up, up the panel, and then thank you so much for coming out to this session. Yeah. What, what we've just heard about in the last few minutes is part of a hugely important yet relatively small part of what has been called now for almost a dozen years the war on terror. And whether it's civil liberties and human rights, uh, whether it's what get call, what's called counterinsurgency, 
or whether it gets called national security. This has to do with profound decisions that are being made through omission or commission. Uh, they have to do with the world that's going to be uh, existing for the next generation. And I want to announce here uh, plans for a tribunal on the war on terror, 2001 to 2013, under the sponsorship of an organization uh, that I'm part of, the Institute for Public Accuracy. And I want to ask everybody in this room and everybody not in this room who's hearing uh, this forum to consider helping us launch this tribunal on the war on terror. Uh, you can go to accuracy.org to see what we do at the Institute uh, and you can contact us that way. And also, if you're in the room, we have some flyers. Uh, the bottom line is we want to do a huge tribunal in Washington, D.C. with documentary testimony on every aspect of the war on terror. And let us use our own capacity to research, organize, and publicize to challenge these policies. Okay, thank you, Norman Solomon. Amy Goodman. Um, two quick thoughts. Um, but one thing, I'm going to be on C-SPAN tomorrow from noon Eastern Standard Time to 3 for an in-depth interview, three hours, and it's going to include a lot of email and, call, and you can call in, and I hope you do. I hope you weigh in. It's a great forum around the country for uh, different voices to be heard. Um, two things, you know, uh, during the time um, of the Iraq War, you had General Colin Powell, who was Secretary of State, leading uh, that, helping to lead that war. And you had his son, Michael Powell, who was head of the FCC, who was leading a war on diversity of voices here at home, pushing for deregulation of the media. Um, the current chair of the FCC, the response then was unbelievable. Millions of people writing into the FCC. This obscure, at the time, agency, suddenly people became aware. And yes, when people learn about what's happening, they respond. They understand that having newspaper, radio, TV um, in one town owned by the same media mogul is a threat to our democracy. Right now, the current head of the FCC, Julius Janikowski, has just announced he's going to be leaving. And another uh, of the five commissioners has announced he's leaving. Um, there are only five commissioners. Um, who heads this agency and what directions President Obama gives them makes an enormous difference for the media landscape in this country. You know, we, um, I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death. And anything less than that is a disservice to the servicemen and women of this country. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they're sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. Here, here. Thank you, Amy Goodman. Now Marjorie Cohn, concluding thoughts. Yes, um, Bradley Manning was tortured for nine months uh, when he was in the military brig at Quantico, Virginia. He was held in solitary confinement. Experts have called that torture. It can lead to hallucinations, catatonia, and suicide. And it was after there was a great public outcry and a letter to the Obama administration from many people from civil society, including, I'm proud to say, 250 law professors, that he was moved out of Quantico and, in, at, at, and into Fort Leavenworth, um, where he is in the general population now. Um, he, he revealed classified information, but not top secret information. Dan Ellsberg revealed top secret information. And Dan has said that Bradley Manning has ref had access to top secret information, but refrained from divulging it. Now they're going after WikiLeaks. The, 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 they are not going after the New York Times, um, Der Spiegel, and The Guardian, who also picked up the story, only WikiLeaks. Um, as Amy said, the secrecy in the Obama administration is unprecedented. Um, James Madison said that sunshine is the best antidote to tyranny, and it's up to us to shed light on what our government is doing in our name. Thank you, Marjorie Cohen. Cohen and now Sonali Kohatkar. Yeah, I just want to uh, call attention to the fact that because today we do have, for now, the ability to hear stories directly by those people who are affected um, through their own words, 
on websites like Rawa's website, on Malalai Joya's website. You can go and see what those people who are affected by the Afghanistan war are saying, thinking, and feeling. Um, go to rawa.org, go to malalaijoya.com, see uh, the statements that they've put out, see the photographs uh, that they uh, use to document the war. Uh, do it yourself because you know when the, when the war was at its peak um, about five or six years ago, uh, there was such a clear correlation in my book. My co-author, uh, Jim Engels, and I did a, a brief uh, study of how media coverage of the Afghanistan war correlated so strongly with attention paid to uh, groups like Rawa and Malalai Joy, even if those stories weren't covering those people directly. Just people went online and just looked up what was happening in Afghanistan more and found the websites of these organizations and these women and thereby supported them, heard their stories. And when the media doesn't cover them, uh, the, uh, the attention that these groups and, and these activists get uh, really falls. As we begin our withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan, it certainly doesn't mean that the war is ending, and it certainly doesn't mean that we should forget about uh, the people whose lives our tax dollars have directly affected. So uh, you know, really, in addition to supporting independent media that, that continue coverage uh, long after the troops have gone, support the, the people on the ground themselves who are making change. Find out what they're doing, what they're saying, what they're going through. Share their documents, their statements, their interviews um, on your uh, social networks and, and keep the word uh, out about uh, how they're dealing with the very, very real effects of our drone attacks, of the night raids, of all of these very destructive policies that have affected ordinary men, women, and children. I mean, we, we may never get to know their faces and, and their names and their families, um, but those who do represent them, some of them are out there, and they are reaching out to us via the internet. And, and as long as the internet is free, you and I do have access to that. So please do you know, explore that, share that, visit their websites, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's, uh, that's Sonali Kohatkar. I'm Jeff Cohen with the Park Center for Independent Media in Ithaca College. I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you for watching on television. And most of all, I'd like to thank Free Press for organizing this successful national conference on media reform. Thank you.